So, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to move straight on um, to the, the next session, um, which is going to be about digital transformation, which I'm sure you'll agree is a, a very pertinent topic at the moment. Um, it's a theme that we've seen become more and more important uh, across industry, but also, as you well know, um, crucial within the government sector as well. So I'm really pleased that uh, Robert Wetzel, um, who is an associate director at the FDA, um, he's going to be joining us to share his experiences um, and to explain specifically how the FDA are ramping up their digital transformation efforts. Just a reminder, as with John, we'll have some time uh, for questions at the end of Robert's session. So submit those through the Q&A module, just as you did before um, throughout the presentation, and we'll take those at the end, and I'll put them to Robert for you. So with no further ado, I'm going to hand over to Robert. Um, so please, Robert, take it away. Well, wow, that was no, no warm-up. OK. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you well. Absolutely. Well, I didn't do I didn't do a radio check, so outstanding. So I'm not going to go into my bio. You guys could look up on on um, LinkedIn who I am, what I do. Uh, one of the things that uh, I, I've I've done different in my government career is that I've been a government full time employee, but I get loaned out kind of like a consultant up until this current position. So when I worked for the Department of Defense, they would send me around to, to work on these large, very large big data problems. And basically it became a joke, uh, uh, hello, I'm from the government and I'm here to help, right? So that's um, and that was the title I gave to this. So I wanna, said no one ever, start with the disclaimer. So anything I say, does not constitute contractual obligation. Uh, you guys can read this. But these are my own thoughts, my own thoughts alone, and I do not speak on the behalf or any official purposes other than I'm talking about digital transformation and some of my experiences. All right, so I'm here because I was asked to, and that's pretty much it. Um, I enjoy giving these talks. Uh, I give these talks at work all the time. And except for it's, uh, you know, within the context of why we need to move out to that direction or that direction or we're, we're going over, we're going that direction. So um, at the bottom of that, you see that little formula of complexity R, the epsilon. That's from my PhD research. If anybody's interested on on how that actually works, contact me directly, and I'm happy to share. But I, I won't bring that up here. So digital transformation, what does that even mean? So I would like folks to just to type in what you think it means inside of the, uh, the I don't even see it on my screen. Wow. So, so and what we're, you know, I'll take those uh, afterwards and, and, um, and address those. But uh, those of you at your keyboard, what does digital transformation mean to you? All right. Truthfully, nobody really cares about this until they really do. Um, so digital transformation and, and point is being able to take in a capability or a requirement to production from an idea to, to implementation. And in the way the government um, typically does business is that we, we spend all this time doing this analysis and digging into requirements and, and architecting up the, the, the next best thing. And three years later, we're, we're deploying the system and the people who wanted it don't realize what the system's for or the need has changed drastically or we've, we've missed the mark entirely and then we get to start all over again. I call this the, uh, it, it, we, we have an, a, a term that I've used before, it's called agile fall should be agile fell but agile fall is the combination we're we're saying agile we're doing agile we're doing sprints we're doing iterations but we're still maintaining the waterfall methodology and mentality so we could get all the way to the end have a failure and then start all over again I've also seen where it comes into play where people just continue to do the analysis of alternatives and, and just not actually take the, you know, take that step out and, and they have a fear of failure. So the thing is, we need to be able to look at our problems, take a capability, be able to, to dissect it, develop it, deploy it, use it. 
and, and, and be ready to destroy it when it's no longer useful. All right, so um, yeah, I'm not gonna read that, but hopefully you're, you are sufficiently inspired in this talk by now because I said some stuff. So we have our first question coming up here. Uh, what is your biggest challenge in bringing digital transformation to your organization? And it may not be a huge digital transformation because you, you, you may only be responsible for a small portion, or you may be uh, responsible for you know larger portions. So just within your area of responsibility, what is your biggest challenge? What do you see the results? So if we just give it a few moments for, for people to click there, there's sometimes a slight lag on the feed, so just some t sometimes have to give them a moment. But when we're ready to go to the results, if you just advance the next slide and that'll bring up the live results for you. Let's see, what do we have here? Lack of a strategy. Wow, okay. Uh, senior leadership, that's a good one. It, you know what? The the I, I see that the lack of ability to move quickly and inability to fund innovation are right at, at the same line as the senior leadership, but the number one is a lack of a strategy. That's that's kind of interesting. I, I'd love to explore that one a little bit further. All right, so um, this basically is the 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 three things that are needed for digital transformation. You have people, processes, and things. So I, I say things are easy, but that's not necessarily true. That's a misconception a lot of times. Things being easy because now I have this smartphone that I can download an app and I can use it. I'm, I'm on a laptop that I just downloaded some code and installed um, our programming language and updated my my files, and I'm able to do that without you know without much IT support. So this is my my laptop at home. I have control over it. I can make it work. It's easy. These do not translate directly into enterprise systems. It does not translate to large data systems. It does not translate into the complexity that's involved in these. So there is a, a, a general consensus that, oh, we can always find somebody to do this technology thing. We've got this other stuff to do. And that's a misconception. Processes, I want to I say something very simple. They're temporary and changeable. For some reason in the government, we want to keep our processes no matter, even if we're not, we're, we're, they're no longer valid. 1972, we, we got rid of COBOL, but we still had that process on how we developed code that fit the COBOL model. So what I'm saying uh, is you do and think about digital transformation, let's, let's look at the processes as what they are. They're a temporary and they're changeable. Don't let those things hold you back and the people are hard because change is hard. Understanding something new is hard. I like the example in the last one where they had the gentleman who was in the 70s working for the government for 50 years and you know was willing to go learn something new. That is such a rarity and, and, and that, that you have somebody who's been doing it this way for so long. This is the way we always done it. It's good enough for, you know, so it was good enough for, for me back then. It's good enough for us now. That is the one and only obstacle that you truly have to get agency buy-in and to move that one, that, that ability for to even have any assemblance of something called digital transformation. Oh, I, already, I got ahead of myself. Sorry. So, so, yeah, I already said that. All right. Key elements of digital transformation. This actually came from one of my MIT uh, uh, MBA executive courses. You you maintain, you destroy, you create, and 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 in doing this process, you you have to create an environment where it's okay to keep doing what you're doing, knowing that's a temporary state. 
that it's okay to destroy and, and, and realize sunk costs is sunk costs and, and give an environment for people to create, to be able to experiment, to, to prototype. That is an important part of, of being um, able to deliver a digital transformation in, in the term of the big digital transformation. So uh, throughout these uh, next set of slides, I'm giving some examples of, of, of where I've worked and some of the uh, obstacles I've overcome. I am not listing agencies per, uh, uh, purposely. I am not uh, mentioning people by name purposely because you know this is this is these are things in the past that has happened that we had to work around. And so, if someone can take some of those lessons learned and apply it to what you do, that is that is the intent of this particular next set of slides. Not to say that hey, we shouldn't have done that. Let's not do it again because more likely somebody will. So at one point in my career, I was the analytical portfolio owner. This is a hundreds of millions of dollars of analytical technical debt. Basically, this is legacy systems and tools that people just did not want to get rid of. They, they, it, you had, uh, I, I had SaaS, like from SaaS from 1980 something all the way to today, and and you had different uh, variations of SaaS. Well. Some of those are no longer even um, – we can't – in the government, we have certain technologies we have to move on and off because they're no longer being maintained. So in, in this process, after doing a um, survey of the user tools in, within just within a SaaS alone, we had that wide range of requirements of skills for people to be able to O&M these things, to be able to protect them, to come up with addition, a, a different sets of mitigations on systems that were no longer being uh, uh, updated, no longer being in, able, able to, to, to move them along. And, 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 and that's a very um, um, risky place to be. Uh, CIO wouldn't like that. The CISO definitely doesn't like that. I I didn't like it having in my portfolio and being responsible for things that no one else has used in ten years except for three people. So where we're at now, I have a, another question that we could get the audience to participate in. What? Uh, oh no, I need my glasses. Which one is the most important of the three in solving the problems that I talked about before. Hey, James, does does do you know in this this platform? I, I apologize. I should have spent more time on learning the platform. Um, does it actually? me when it's ready to move up to the next one or do i have to like no so yeah it's entirely up to you uh, we'll just give oh, the okay. audience a, a moment or two to get their answers in um it's you know sometimes it takes a little little while for people to get their responses in just to remind okay. to the audience make sure you click your answer and hit submit make sure you hit that submit button but whenever you're robert uh, ready robert just click on the advanced slide button and it'll move to the results i got gotcha. you no a, a platform i did before it actually pop up and say uh you know percent of the audience done oh do i get to, i get to select two i didn't do that last time you can do uh, yes i believe ah. so <laughs> ah, i'm gonna select something i submitted it and now so which one that was a trick question it was all all of them because they're all equally important right so the the the, the problem with uh you know, trying to do digital transformation, there's so many different nuances and different levels and, and different things that have to come together. It's like you, you can't go, well, we have people who know the technology, we can get it done. Well, yeah, you can only get part of it done. Same way with, oh, we got people who understand how to, uh, uh, you know, how to, how to get the uh, budget and, and how to move the budget to do innovative things it's it is that combination of all the above but i can tell you from the the that position i was talking about with the analytical platforms 
the the tools that we were using are narrowly scoped and, and on reporting objectives. That was the the reason that was we have a problem. They we built a system. That system solved that problem, and then we have another problem. We build another system to solve that problem. And, and in that process, we end up with all these different systems that basically did the same thing. I get data from here. I bring it in here. I'm going to curate this data. And then after I curate this data, I'm going to run some reports. And I'm going to do some visualizations. And then I'm going to produce a report to give to somebody. That big set of things was done over and over again in different systems. Yeah, see, it was, a, it was a trick question. So, so basically, we still have to do the thing that we do, maintain, keep the, the, uh, the current infrastructure tools in place, continue uh, existing contract program efforts unless it's identified as a redundant effort. You want to have your contracting people work with you uh, to, uh, to identify the contracts, the tools, and programs that can be phased out or merge because if you have three tools doing the exact same thing, why are you paying for three separate instances of the same tool? You, you still have to continue to receive uh, new requirements and capability requests from your user base, but you, you want to look at what is already within your portfolio, not the ones you're going to get rid of, not the redundant, but the ones that does continue, and, and, then, and then see if that can help or meet that that need for that user base. Um, the key to that was looking at this from the software development lifecycle. So if I had a tool that was going to be out of lifecycle coming up this year, then that tool gets moved to the top of that's one of them we're going to look at to get rid of first. Now, if that tool is the only tool that did that type of, of analytic capability, by the way, that's not how it works, but if it was, then we would have to find a way to maintain that tool or replace that capability if that capability is still within the needs of our users. But uh, basically, this is just mostly business as normal. Now, this is creative destruction. This is why people bring me into their agency. Um, I tend to take the grenade, the pin out of the grenade, leave it on the, the, the conference table, and walk out the room, uh, and, and then it, it blows it uh, all up. And now we, we got people thinking differently. We have people panicking. You have people going, wow, I didn't know that was even possible. So you have to be open to, to, to when a new invention comes out, be able to destroy what came before, what came before it. So if you have a redundant effort and you have an innovation comes out, a new product, it's awesome. It does it met the needs. It went through you went through your acquisition process, but then you have some people like I've been using this version of SaaS since Windows eighty um, you know, Windows three point one. I don't see the change. I'm gonna stay right where I'm at. Do not be afraid to use this to destroy and, and, and realize sunk cost is always sunk cost. There's, there's, there's some ways to buy down this technical debt when you, when you move to new platforms, when you migrate, when you do digital transformation. But sunk cost cannot be the consideration because you keep putting money into the sunk cost of the system. It's that money pit of the house. You know, I, I, one time I owned this, this, this big uh, house from 1875, and it's you know just that, you know, wow, this is a great house. It's you know it's got the old look to it. it has all, but that house costs so much money just to keep it up, right? So that's the same way with technology. If you're living in the past, you cannot move to the future. So do not be afraid to use creative destruction, and 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 move out of your rut. So I have a question here, uh, based on on what was just said. Creative destruction. How would how would you even do that, right? 
how would you do a creative destruction? So it, it, there's not really a, a wrong answer, and this is not a trick question. So at, at an agency, we had three versions of an enterprise software that a vendor sold to three different offices within my agency. Those of you who understand what enterprise software means, you have one enterprise software license for the entire agency. Somehow, each one of these offices needed this, this capability, decided to go through the acquisition process. No one caught that they were actually buying the same enterprise license across three offices. So in, in that process, we eliminated two and then kept the one that expand that contract. But two contracts got completely destroyed. Oh, thank you. All right. So one of the things from that is that you you need to be able to rationalize and merge these portfolios. That and don't be afraid to be aggressively in doing this. The idea is that you want to create a user base for uh, your uh, capabilities for your user base, and then ca creating these capabilities for your user base, it's not stagnant. What we need today is not what we're going to need tomorrow. Hopefully, some of what we need today will be some of tomorrow because to be able to change that drastically, especially in the government, it's a very difficult thing to do. So create accepted key performance indicators. Run analysis based on those KPIs, on the technologies in your contract vehicles. Again, I keep saying sunk costs are sunk costs, and, and don't take it personally. I had a program that I just loved. I loved the technology. I loved doing the work. It was absolutely fun to code on. I adored it. But at some point, it started be to become like that, that 1875 home I owned that it was just costing too much, and we had new inventions and new technologies that just surpassed it. So be aggressive, be proactive, set your KPIs, and use analysis on your things and stuff, and, and, and realize, don't take it personally. All right, so I just said this is a break, but I don't know if it's a real break or not. I dropped a lot of, of information very shortly. And, in, and if anybody's looking to go deeper into the presentation here, you can email me at that email below. That's my personal email. Um, I keep work email and personal email separate. This is fun. Work is, well, it's also fun, but it's a different type of fun. So anybody who would like to reach out to me, please use that email address. And the, lastly, my favorite, create a safe space for innovation. So innovation comes in two types. You have the little I, little innovation, and the big I, big innovation. And the reason I, I, I talk about it in that, that fashion, little I is I'm adding capabilities to an existing, um, existing system. I'm, I'm improving something I have. Or I'm, I'm upgrading uh, from SAS 9.4 server to SAS via. And by the way, I'm saying SAS. I'm not, I'm not saying, hey, we all should go buy SAS. It's awesome. It's just this is what I'm working on today. That was my meeting I was in just before I came here. How to how to how do we get from where we're at with all the SASs and come to what what it should look like and look right for us. So that's why it's 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 in my mind, and that's why I keep using that as an example. So those are already established technologies. Those are already in your, my environment. You have similar technologies that you already have in your environment. You're upgrading. You're adding capability. That is little i. So it's not a radical change. It doesn't change how you do business. It just gives you more features. Maybe it's faster. Maybe it's better. Maybe it's stronger. You know, that's that's little i. Big i. Big i is hard. Big I is we need to come up with something radically different than what we do today. Right now, we have this, this COVID-19 pandemic going on all over the world. And this is very um, 
disconcerting when when you need to have data in real time of the the drug supply chain. So we know when we're starting to run out of different parts and things that make up the drugs. But because the data and the way we do things today, we don't have real time. We have uh, data that sits over in a system that belongs to the CDC. We have data that sits over that belongs to a the pharmacies. We have data, so it's in different places. So we have to go through and start. How do we aggregate? How do we bring it in? How do we uh, curate? How do we? So it's data science, but at the speed of light. So that's a problem that we have to come up with. And so big I is where this comes into play. So at the, one of the DOD agencies I work for, I got to work with a group called Softworks. It's a group down in Tampa, Florida. They have this uh, innovation capability. They are not for profit. They bring in uh, citizen scientists. They throw out challenges, they throw out problems. And then you go in and say, I can solve that drone problem. I can build a, a, a swarming uh, autonomic drone to uh, jam um, cell phone signals. I don't know if it's a thing. I just made that up. And and then you're able to do that. So from that experience, I was able to, to take it back to my agency, create a foundry, a crucible forge battle hardened foundry. You brought a technology in, you want a prototype, you want to experiment. You went through the process. It met certain criteria. It gets promoted up or it gets dismissed out. And then it goes to the crucible. And in the crucible, it, can it withstand the cyber? If it can, it gets promoted up. If it can't, it gets, it gets dropped out. To the forge is where you you put all your, your con ops, ATO, all the paperwork together, and then it goes into your production ready. That is that is what we did. That created a safe space for innovation. People could come. They bring some money. And instead of $5 billion to test something, you bring in 50 k stand up some technology, it's going to work. It also informs your RFP or RFI even more because now you have real requirements that you can write on based on from these experiments. And through this, there's a process called other transaction authorities. These funding vehicles are out there. They're there for a reason. They're there for our D, T, and E funds only. They're not to take a, pro, a problem to production. They're not to take a, hey, build this and put it in production, but it's, it is a place to experiment and prototype and show proof of concepts. And it's a combination of bringing together industry, academics, labs, government, stakeholders. And that is a very, very, very powerful avenue of bringing something to, to, to uh, production. Project Vulcan. It's a ventilator-v.com. Check it out. This was from the pandemic. We had trouble with ventilators across the, the, the world, uh, not having enough, not having the right ones in the right places, expensive to manufacture, silver broken. They put a challenge out. And at the end of, of 51 days, you had five accepted um, of these ventilators in, in human trials that each one of them costs less than $500. That's what this type of, of, of innovation can bring to you. So uh, leaders, if you wanna be someone that does digital transformation, you wanna make things happen, you wanna bring new to your, your organization, become leaders in innovation. Uh, where does innovation come from? This one's gonna be, this is, this is uh, actually, this was on one of my tests when I was in college. Yes, I still have my college books. James, is that uh, five minutes? I just saw that. Is that now or five minutes from five minutes ago? <laughs> You've got about two minutes, but we can, you know, if we if we go a little long, that's not a problem. Um, so so don't worry too much about that. Um, it's just to give you a guide, really. Individual small teams. But no one believes that supervisors can bring innovation? Wait, senior leaders can't bring innovation? So, so the people who said individuals is correct. That's, that's where most innovation does come from. Uh, just so happens I'm a senior and an individual. 
that's a good place to be. All right, so this big number, it's all I just, I just put it on there. Now, are you sufficiently, sufficient, I could sufficiently, I can't even say the word to, now, I need some water, sufficiently inspired? Did this inspire any of you? Thank you. No, thank we you, did. Robert. That was um, really, really interesting uh, talk there. So thank you for taking the time to to share your insights with us. Um, I, I thought that was really useful. I'm sure the, the audience did as well. Um, so in order to submit your questions, Robert, do just use the, the Q&A module um, and you can submit those and we'll go through as many as we can. I'm just having a quick quick look at what's come through here. Um, we've got plenty of responses um, to the questions around um, what, what is innovation and those um, long text answers. Um, so the first question rather than comment, lots of comments, but the first question I'm seeing there is uh, how do I measure and report innovation ROI uh, and outcomes to senior leadership? You can't. It's a misconception. Um, dun, dun, dun. Just so happens I have it right here. Ralph Katz. I don't know if you can see that. Ralph Katz, K-A-T-Z. Uh, Dr. Katz is a, a senior lecturer at MIT, the human side of managing technical innovation. He tells you why the return on investment and innovation is not there, because innovation is, is not the, the end result. It is the process of. So when you take innovation and it becomes into your part of your, your life cycle of your, your, you know, your data centric life cycle, it, it now becomes part of the innovation by A, it's, it's reduced time to production or it's reduced cost to production. So it, you know, until you actually put it into your pipeline, it, it is really not a measurement. It's just a, it's just a, it's, it, it, innovation is just innovation. By the way, government, does, we don't have return on investment. We, we have a public sector um, measurement that we, because we don't sell a product. Absolutely. We, uh, I know that was part of the discussion that we had in the panel um, yesterday's session. So uh, an interesting point, definitely there. I wish I had it aside. I was, I was tied up yesterday. No, it's not a problem. It's, uh, we're having a conversation around exactly that. How do you measure, uh, how do you quantify kind of ROI or, you know, the return if you're making an investment? How do you measure the response to that in a, a public sector environment? I don't know if you have any kind of thoughts on it. Maybe you could expand a little on the way that you approach that. Well, it, it, so it's a return on, 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 on goodness, right? So at my agency, we're trying to bring drugs to you faster, safer, uh, that cost less. Um, and, and part of that is the, what the, 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 you know, is the drug safe? That's very important. And then does the drug work? Is that, that's very important. And, and is, is the, is the drug worse than the actual illness? You know, so these are all things that we can measure as no, it's not a return on investment, but we, we it's it's a, it's to the public's good. Yeah, absolutely makes sense. But it's a, definitely a good way to look at it. Good philosophy. And there's a there's a comment here which I, I think is really interesting. So I'm going to kind of reformat it slightly uh, into a question. So. Um, this is from Joe Perez, um, and he says, that, um, to answer your previous question, um, he thinks it's about striking a balance between not reinventing the wheel um, and, and also the mentality of um, being stuck with the dinosaur, that kind of mindset. So how do you balance that kind of um, willingness to dis destroy, the willingness to cause destruction, but also ensuring that you aren't sacrificing security? Where does the balance lie between that, that, that pendulum swing almost? So that's more of an art form than it is a hard and fast rule. So um, one of the things that I'm very big on is the reusability. If something is reusable, I'm going to maintain it. So I have a program now. They've built a, a, a data warehouse and a hybrid data lake. It, it, it works within a very small group of subset of things. It is actually very well put together. 
I'm going to use that as the uh, infrastructure's code for the base for the larger effort that we're bringing all of all of these in together. So, and and it's based on open source. You have a lot of open source, but you you know we do have COTS in there too. So it's you use the combination of what's available, you use what's out there, you bring it together, and you get the best value for for your your customer base because it, it's not about me. Here's your tool, James. Go go do good work. It's like James, what do you need? Let me let me get your user needs, and then walk through the process of building that or buying that or adapting that or adopting that and then use those combinations of all those different ways to look at systems and building and things then your things become you know it yes i i, I destroyed it because we don't use cobol on any of our mainframes anymore As a matter of fact only mainframe that we're running is doing high, high performance computing and scientific uh, analysis of peptides and other things. I'm not I'm not a biologist. My doctor is in computer science, so have no. So when they hear Dr. Wetzel and they start talking doctor doctor stuff to me, I am not there. So 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 you have to have a balance, and 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 don't be so quick to destroy, but also don't be so not quick and want to hang on to it till you have a zombie, which means it's just limping along for the last, you know, five, six, eight, 12 years. And, and it costs $3 million to change an interface. Unacceptable behavior. Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, it's a great answer. And I'm going to draw on uh, Elaine from Survey Monkey again here. Her, her kind of take on digital transformation, I think is quite interesting. She said she views it as constant change. Um, and I suppose my, my question, based on uh, Elaine's response there, is how, when change is constant, right, you could, you're always going to have to innovate, you can't really rest on your laurels, you're going to have to change again and again. How, and you talked about the concept of reusability as well. Rather than looking back at things you've done before and thinking, how can I reuse them? How do you design that reusability in the first place? How do you, or can you start by thinking, Right. How do I solve this problem? But how can I also make sure that it's going to be as reusable as possible when you don't necessarily know what you're going to be re reusing it for? Do you have any tips on that? That is a actually that's a pretty interesting question. I write that one down because I'm going to use that one again. So it, and 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 whoever put it down, make sure I get their name because I'm going to give them credit for it. Um, that's what the the innovation design labs are for. You you have the foundry where you put together those requirements and you're gonna experiment and then you have the crucible to, to see if it's it's within the cybersecurity, does it work within in the environment? And then and then when you you put it through the forge, you'll finalize that. So you build that in in your CI C D pipeline, which is the continuous improvement, continuous deployment. But then once you have something that's gone through that lab, it now goes into a pre-production pipeline, which now starts your DevSecOps. And that's a continuous cycle it's like a you know the infinity we just keep going because you always want to get to something better because as you said earlier you just can't build it once and be done with it i'm done i'm i'm time for me you know it is a continuous process and that is a digital transformation mindset that a lot of um um long time bureaucrats have have forgotten or didn't know or it's never been exposed to, or you know. So that is that is part of the people problem that we face when you bring somebody in who comes from you know Apple. They're used to building thing or Google. The Googles the Googles build something and 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 deploy it within an hour. Uh, we're still working. It's it's uh, three years. We're about to get our ATO. We're flying. Yeah, absolutely. And it brings me on actually very nicely to, to the next question that's come through, which is um, related to that mindset. It's about how do you how do you get senior leaders to um, accept change and embrace change? So as you say, you might have um, people who are, haven't been exposed to that mindset before, that, that been in bureaucracy, haven't, haven't got that approach um, that you've just kind of outlined there. How and how far can you um, instill that mindset into them? And, and what tips would you give to do that? I have a mace. It's like a, a, a ten pound mace. Um, <laughs> that that usually helps. Uh, no, seriously, this is this is part of what was talked about last time. It's the communication. It's 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 rebranding of what you're doing. For the last seven months, I have been telling the same story for seven months, and and I still have people who.